Welcome to The Mortarboard, the administrator's source for solutions in higher education. We tell you about challenges other schools have faced, benchmark the problem, share their best practices and epic fails, and invite you to consider whether what worked for them might also work at your institution. Hosted by longtime college president Dr. Dan Barwick, this is The Mortarboard, the source for solutions in higher education. Welcome to The Mortarboard, your source for solutions in higher education. I'm Dan Barwick. Welcome to the podcast. If the content of this podcast interests you, then you'll enjoy my new book, Risk and Reward, How Small Colleges Get Better Against the Odds. It's now available from Amazon in ebook, paperback, and audiobook format. The best way to find it is to head over to my blog, mortarboardblog.com, and click on the link on the front page. If you have any thoughts about the book, don't hesitate to send me an email and let me know what you think. With me today to discuss her recent article in the Chronicle of Higher Education entitled The Pandemic Hit Female Academics Hardest, Liz McMillan. As executive editor of Chronicle Intelligence, Liz McMillan brings more than 30 years of experience covering higher education. From 2011 to 2018, she served as the editor of the Chronicle of Higher Education, supervising a newsroom of 65 reporters, editors, data journalists, and designers who produce a daily news report, weekly print edition, and special supplements along with in-depth reports. Under her leadership, the Chronicle Newsroom received awards from the Online News Association, the Society for News Design, and the Education Writers Association. She received her bachelor's degree from the University of Pennsylvania and was a recipient of the Knight Wallace Journalism Fellowship at the University of Michigan. Liz, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. You recently spoke with five leading thinkers about the pandemic's differential impact on female academics. What was your top intellectual takeaway from the interview? And what was the primary emotion you felt after speaking with these women? Yeah, so uh, my top takeaway was just how far behind so many institutions are in supporting women faculty members. And one of the uh, scholars I spoke to, Jessica Calarco, put it really well. Uh, she says, most countries have safety nets. The United States has women. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I think what she was getting at is how much of the caregiving responsibilities uh, fall onto women, as well as supporting students and supporting colleagues. And it just all added up to a tremendous amount of stress for women and also uh, a really big impact on productivity. And I would say uh, my sort of emotion uh, uh, in hearing all of that was frustration that institutions are where they are in not really understanding this problem. This is not a new problem. It has gotten worse during the pandemic. But women scholars have struggled with balancing family, with balancing the various service requirements for years. And so I feel frustrated and some sadness that people have to struggle. Well, it's possible that what you just shared did um, preview a part of the answer to this next question. Some of the interviewees had participated in large-scale surveys of women in academics. What did they find? So uh, that was one study I am most familiar with, which was done at Indiana University in uh, December and January of 2021. I think about 350 faculty members, staff, and graduate students participated in that survey. And even when women had increased caregiving responsibilities at home, they weren't necessarily uh, slacking off on their core task at the university, whether it was teaching or working with students. What was getting cut instead was research. And that's uh, pretty consistent with what uh, lots of places started to see last summer in terms of uh, a reduced number of papers and manuscripts being submitted by women across all fields. And so that seems, you know, that's one study, a, a microcosm of what's happening uh, across the board. I hope I'm saying this name right. Vinit Aurora 
mm-hmm. the dean of medical education at the University of Chicago, seemed to suggest in the interview that she would like to see women be able to volunteer a recent childbirth as a reason for lowered productivity or a gap in productivity, and has even come up with an evaluation tool called the COVID contribution matrix. Should the pandemic alter how faculty are evaluated in general? And should there be any reflection of gender in those evaluations? Well, that's a a really great question. And, you know, like many, many things, uh, the promotion and tenure standards at the institutions, people have been talking about that for years, um, how narrowly defined they are, how uh, razor uh, focused, laser focused rather, they are on research and citations. Um, I think her broader point is that there are lots of ways that scholars are contributing in this particular moment. And so she's in the medical field. She is both a clinician and the dean of medical education at uh, the University of Chicago. And there are lots of ways that uh, those professors are contributing, whether it's uh, running vaccine clinics is one, uh, one thing she mentioned, community engagement. But none of those things are really, really matter when it comes down to your tenure file or your promotion file. There is some movement. We've done some reporting at the Chronicle about how some institutions are expanding the lens for how faculty members should be evaluated um, to include uh, those kinds of things. So service is an area that they're trying to bring more attention to, but it's very, very few institutions so far that have made those changes. And I think it'll be interesting to see uh, just what the pandemic spurs institutions to do. This may come up in a later question, but um, if you think about the graduate students that are in school right now, and you think about all the young scholars who've started their first year of teaching, this particular period, we thought it was going to be a year, it's clearly going to be longer than that, is uh, really going to affect people's career trajectories. And you can't put a candidate up to compare with someone pre-pandemic and and not see this gap. So how how are institutions going to address that gap fairly and equitably? When you described how it was research that suffers when this happens, uh, I had a roommate in graduate school who got a, his first job out of graduate school. And when he met with his chair, his chair was reviewing with him what it takes to get tenure. And the chair just said, uh, average of two publications a year in peer reviewed journals. And my friend looked at him and said, you know, stammered out something like, well, um, what about um, teaching and, and mm-hmm. that sort of thing? And the chair just stared back at him and said, an average of two <laughs> articles a year in peer-reviewed journals. And the funny thing is when when you describe that research suffers, I immediately think of that incident because I mm-hmm. think um, somebody who is suddenly has a lot of responsibilities because of the pandemic, uh, I don't see how they could not be harmed um, mm-hmm. in terms of the only thing that the school might care about. Well, I, I think that's absolutely right, but it's – not just if you have caregiving responsibilities, it's also the kind of work and research you might do. So if you're working with human subjects and doing that kind of research, so much of that work has been disrupted. If you do uh, international work or it requires, um, say, you're in archaeology or you're doing uh, work across the uh, or around the world, you couldn't travel. Um, think about laboratories that had to shut down. I know that many of them have come back online, but for some time there, they weren't. So it's it's a complex situation, and and caregiving, of course, is a huge piece of this. But it's a lot of uh, research that's been affected. Well, your interview focused a bit on elder care, which not many institutions make accommodations for. Can you explain the issue and where it might go from here? 
Yeah. Um, so that was a really interesting uh, subject that a uh, the scholar from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst brought up. Um, they seem to be really ahead of the curve. Uh, the union at UMass actually negotiated for uh, elder care provisions and support way back probably 15 years ago. So they had this provision in place before the pandemic. That is very, very unusual. They provide funds for elder care uh, support to faculty members. The AARP is trying to draw attention uh, to this issue that the caregiving problem right now is not just taking care of children. It can be taking care of spouses, parents, grandparents, siblings. And there really is no acknowledgement of that uh, at most institutions. So um, especially if you think now about how many people have uh, been sick uh, with with COVID or may have lingering effects from it, or not to mention all the other kinds of conditions that people might be struggling with. So it, this is very uh, early days in terms of um, seeing how many institutions would bring this into their their thinking about benefits and supports for faculty. Robinson Fulweiler of Boston University explained to you her ideas about laying out what expectations are and what they should be. Uh, Her example is maternity leave. She claims that the expectations, even for a maternity leave, are not clear. She asks, are you really supposed to not go to faculty meetings? Some Mm -hmm. people go, some people don't. Uh, Are you supposed to mentor your undergraduates, advise them for classes? She holds that a lot of institutions do not have clear expectations of what leave looks like. I must confess that the institutions where I've worked, it always seemed to me that the expectations were clear. If you were on leave, you were on leave. But I I suspect that the experience of women might turn out to be different than mine. Yeah, I think that's definitely the case. And what I think she's referring to or what she had in mind was uh, the woman on the tenure track, someone who did not have tenure, someone who was not a full professor. And there's a certain amount of anxiety about, um, you know, should I still, even if I'm on leave, be doing the sorts of things that I will eventually be uh, evaluated for? So, um, she maintains, and uh, she had done uh, some research and had published a paper with uh, colleagues on this, that there there really is not consistent um, understanding and expectations at institutions across the country about what actually uh, should or should not be done on, a, on maternity leave. So, you know, she's getting at a problem that I, I was, it was new to me, but I certainly uh, am persuaded by her research. Do you see policies or practices changing as a result of the pandemic? Well, you know, we've talked about the uh, promotion and tenure uh, criteria and will those be widened? Um, I think that's one possibility. Uh, A number of institutions have uh, delayed the tenure clock uh, so that you have a little bit more time before you go up for tenure. The problem with that policy change is that um, it's not as beneficial to women as you might think. Um, So what research has found is that men who take advantage of the uh, delayed tenure clock uh, use it for exactly what it's supposed to do, to help them finish and uh, their research, complete the work that they are expected to do. With women, they often tend to use that time for caregiving. And so it doesn't end up being the kind of panacea that you might think uh, for women. So they need to really look at other measures. Um, the professor you just referenced, um, she actually goes by Wally, Wally Fulwaller, was talking about um, – suggesting, is there a particular year? So let's say you're coming up for tenure. Is there a particular year that you think uh, is the best exemplar of your work? And should that be the, the, the time that you're evaluated on? That was her suggestion. I don't, I don't think that that's very widespread at this point. Your point about the, the different ways that men and women would use the leave time or the extension uh, Mm -hmm. is, is fascinating. It, the, from the way you described it, it sounds like the ability to extend the time until you're evaluated actually widens 
this sort of gender gap Mm -hmm. by allowing men to create even more work upon (laughs) which they would be evaluated while women do not don't. Exactly. Uh, you, You put it well. So institution after institution has done precisely that extended the tenure clock, but I'm, I think it will be really interesting to look at in a few years to see well what effect did that really have did it did it help women or did it tend to uh, exacerbate the very situation that it was meant to to help my guest has been liz mcmillan executive editor of chronicle intelligence at the chronicle of higher education she served as editor of the chronicle from 2011 to 2018 liz thanks very much for joining us today Thank you. Thanks for joining me. Please feel free to email me with questions, comments, or suggestions for content that you'd like to hear about. You can reach me at mortarboardpodcast at gmail.com. Consider stopping by my blog, mortarboardblog.com. The blog contains links to stories that I think will interest you, podcast transcripts, and articles I've written. You can also like me on Facebook at Dr. Daniel Barwick or follow me on Twitter at Daniel Barwick. Looking forward to talking with you in the next episode.